Welcome to the Ohio Arts Council's Rife Gallery. This is a programming series for the current show, Quilt National 2021, the best of contemporary quilts. This exhibition is produced and circulated by the Dairy Barn Art Center in Athens, Ohio. Today, we're thrilled to present Sandy Schellenberger, one of our 30 exhibiting artists. But first, there's just a bit of housekeeping to go over. Everyone tuning in today is in listen only mode, so feel free to utilize the chat function in your control panel to ask questions. We'll monitor those questions throughout the presentation and be sure to ask them dur during the Q&A portion of the hour. Next, live captioning is available for the artist talk and you can access those by clicking on the closed caption icon and selecting show subtitle. Also, please keep in mind that because we're presenting from separate locations, there may be some variation of bandwidth for internet stability. So if one of us freezes up or the sound fluctuates, thanks in advance for bearing with us. And lastly, to get everyone comfortable, go ahead and click on the chat function in your control panel to say hello and let us know where you're tuning in from. Okay, thanks everyone for joining. Now to you, Sandy. Thank you. I'm very excited to be here this afternoon. I want to thank the Ohio Arts Council, Kat Sheridan and Amy Wisman for asking me to speak about my art and my process. It's an honor to be part of Quilt National 21 and to be included in the exhibition at the Rife Gallery. I live just south of Conneaut, Ohio, near the Pennsylvania border. Conneaut is the northeast tip of Ohio and in about an hour northeast of Cleveland. I live in a rural area on 55 acres that was once my husband's grandparents' farm. My studio is an addition that is attached to my house that we had built in 1992 and finished two years later. My education is in nursing. I worked as an RN for 33 years while raising my two sons. I left nursing in 2014 to focus more on my art and teaching. I always enjoyed sewing. I took my first quilting class in 1984. My art education was symposiums and workshops with different instructors at the Quilt Surface Design Symposium, which was founded by Nancy Crow and Linda Fowler. Um, I was there very early on. I wasn't at the very first one in 1990, but I was there in the early 90s. And at that time, it was held at the Pontifical College of Josephina in Columbus. I also studied several times at Peters Valley Craft School in Layton, New Jersey, and I had a week-long seminar at Indiana University of Pennsylvania. I'm a member of Art Quilt Network, which was also founded by Nancy Crow and Linda Fowler, and that is a gathering of quilt artists across the country meeting twice a year in Columbus for educational retreats and sharing. I've been a member of Art Quilt Network since 1995, I am a member of Textile Art Alliance, which is a Cleveland-based textile group, the Northwestern Pennsylvania Artists Association, and a monthly critique group called the Tens, and there are 11 of us, so it's 10 plus one. <laughs> um, I teach multiple surface design techniques and encaustics. So this is where we're gonna start to share. My mouse. There we go. Uh, we're gonna start with the blank canvas. And this is where we have either the blank design wall. If you're a painter, you have a blank canvas. Drawing on blank canvas, drawing a new page. My life's a work in progress. I keep learning as I age. And this is my philosophy. I like to stay curious and I like to keep learning. This was my very first quilt. This class I took in 1984, and it was called Star. The class was called Star Wall Hanging. I didn't have any quilters in my family, so I didn't have the preconceived notion that quilts had to be for the bed. Oh, and I also wanted to say uh, other the other ladies in the class went for very pretty florals, and I went for the orange and paisley. Uh, this is a sampler quilt that I made, and I'm very glad that I approached quilting from a traditional background because I learned how to draft my own blocks and piece and measure. 
so that the construction is flat. This is one of my first original designs, and it's a medallion quilt. It's probably about 36 by 36, and it uses Ginny Beyer fabric. It was a border fabric, I remember. Uh, some, some people that go way back remember Ginny Beyer fabrics. And then here is a close up of the um, hand quilting. And then this one is called Japanese Star, and it's an expanded traditional block. This is about 30 by 30. This one called It's a Jungle Out There. I have a, an affinity for tigers and lions and wild cats, so that, that'll be a recurring theme that you see as I go along. This quilt is fairly large, it's 45 by 60, and it is also hand quilted. This is about 1990, and this quilt was exhibited at Quilter's Heritage Celebration, which was held in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Uh, so I started entering competitions early on, uh, first more traditional and then more uh, the art-based shows. So I'm very deadline driven. <laughs> I like to have a deadline to enter things. Detail of the quilting. And this one again is hand quilted. And then you can see here, this is a very different direction. And this was after a week long class with Nancy Crow and it's improvisational piecing. So it's a change in pattern, direction, color, format. And also um, we didn't use rulers in that class too. We used rulers on the first day and then the rulers went out the window and um, we just kind of abstracted and made things uh, larger. So this was a very uh, turning point for me and for my work. And the next turning point was learning that there was hand dyed fabrics and that you could dye them yourself. So, and also learning how to screen print. So I did some dyeing, I took some dyeing classes and um, I studied with Ann Johnston and then I was combining that with uh, commercial cloth. So here's this sample of what parfait dyeing would look like or low water immersion dyeing. And this is, uh, the, the fabric is stacked and then there's dyes added in between. And so the process is on the left and the resulting fabric is on the right. And this piece is called Born Free. So this is a combination of commercial fabric. The tiger print was a commercial fabric, but the rods and the cage, the 3D cage was made out of the hand dyed fabrics that I had done. And this was probably in the mid 1990s and very cutting edge for the time because it had fringe on the bottom. <laughs> This is called Tribal Tigers. This is 36 by 36. This is in my collection. It hangs in my dining room. I drew the tiger faces and then made a screen. I use a thermofax for it to, to make screen prints. And then I hand dyed the backgrounds of the faces and it's combined with African fabrics. So this is called Tribal Tigers. And there's a close up of the face and the quilting. And in the cat line, again, this one's called Young Male. And I drew the motif and screen printed him. I also made a jacket with this motif to watch the Lion King in. <laughs> For me, my inspiration is more internal usually than external. And so this black and blue series is one of the first times, well, not the first time, but where um, I was journaling and using an airbrush to process, uh, to process things. So this is more personal. So the, the words were airbrushed and then cut apart and repieced. And so it looks like a puzzle. And then there's like a secret message or hidden messages in it. Uh, so this is called black and blue number one resistance. So it's about letting go, but not really wanting to let go. And that piece is about 30 by 30. 
And I did 10 pieces in this series. And so you can see a little bit of the echo quilting that I did around the pieces parts of letters. And also about this time, I got a mid-arm quilting machine. So I was quilting, still doing free motion quilting, but on a larger machine. This one is called Black and Blue Number 3 Process. And this piece was accepted into Quilt National 2005. And it also received a Juris Award of Merit. Okay, so it's not all doom and gloom. I like to have a sense of humor. And so I had an extra block with the word depressed. So first I find it funny that I had an extra depressed laying around and then I cut up the block and pieced it and it was a small quilt 19 by 19. So I called it a little depressed. And so it cracks me up because I was very clever too. <laughs> this piece is called wrong again. So there's airbrushed words in the center. Um, but it's got a different feel to it. It's got a more zen-like feel to it, I think. And the quilting is like water ripples. And I quilted it in black fabric, so the quilting stands out. And this series was, in my, uh, was part of a solo exhibit. So it was one of my first solo exhibits, too. I really like graffiti and I'm inspired by graffiti a lot. And um, in this case, I did the airbrushing, but I wanted it to, to look like it was against a brick wall. So the quilt pattern is uh, bricks. And so it gives the quilt some structure. And here is a detail close up of the structure and the airbrush and you can see the spattering of the paint. This one is called, the first one, the one before is called gray matter. And this one is called security blanket. Um, same process with the uh, bricks in the background. Same. And then I went to bullseyes and hand painted quilts. So this was even more freeing and I am flinging paint basically with a paintbrush and inside my studio I have two small rooms I have a closet and I have a paint room with a sink so that's where I do my airbrushing and it has a vent that also takes the excess paint to the outside so it's vented the wall in there is very interesting <laughs> so this was my first piece first bullseye I was angry at the time and so I did use red and puke green. So it, and it's very th therapeutic to fling paint. <laughs> uh, and it's so I call it like the action painting. Um, so after I did that, after I was no longer angry, I thought, what if, what would happen if I used a single color? And so there's wet areas and dry areas of the fabric. So as you're flinging, paint it blends in different areas so this is bullseye number two this piece is about 47 by 38 inches and this was uh, a monotone black and white this one i love i'm using dynaflow paints at this time and this is a paint that acts like a dye so this is burnt umber and what I love about this piece is the dye molecules separate. And so I, even though it's one color, you get this silvery blue around the edges here, if you can see that. Then uh, the I, it's the same process, but the fabric is wetter and I'm using more colors. And I also pieced in some lattice strip. So this piece is titled Flow. It's one of my favorite pieces. I just like the way the colors mixed and blended. And here's a detail. And also this quilt, I quilted more in the ripple, echoey, curvy kind of feel. This next piece is very bright and the colors were inspired from a trip to Mexico. So this piece is called Tequila Sunrise. Okay. 
while I was also quilting, I did take some classes in encaustic and I started uh, doing some encaustic pieces in about 2010. And so when I was working with the encaustic, I wondered how can I combine that with my fiber? So this, it's, this process is a little bit complicated and a little bit hard to describe, but it's photo images of my hand stitching. So I actually hand stitched a block. I did photo images of it. And then it was applied to cradled boards, which were eight by eight by one and a half inch deep with wax medium. And then the blocks were arranged and assembled. Um, I ordered $500 worth of blocks, not knowing if this was going to work. <laughs> and uh, I would recommend not starting with assembling 12 <laughs> for your first project. But um, number one, this is textures number one and textures number one and number three were accepted into Fiber Arts International in Pittsburgh. So even though they're not fiber, it's a fiber technique and they're assembled like in quilt like fashion as well. So this is a detail of textures one. This is textures two. So I was playing with grayscale. And I also, uh, there was variations on how you could turn the block. So, and I, the photo imagery is the reverse side of the stitching because I think the knots and the strings and that that show are more interesting. And then this is number three. So you can see the, the, the grayscale all in one piece. And so it's just, there's so many sets and variables that you can do with this process. And uh, going back to number two, my last week of nursing, I found out um, this piece was accepted into the best of show in Ohio Designer Craftsman. So it was the best of 2014. And it was my last week of, of nursing, and I found out that I got an award of excellence for $1,000. So to me, it was a sign that I was doing the right thing. Okay, same process, but a different hand, stitched, hand stitching, a more open weave. And I didn't assemble the blocks, but left the blocks so that you could arrange them as you wanted. This piece is called Roundabout. And the blocks again are eight by eight by one and a half inch deep. And this piece was in Focus Fiber 2016 at Kent State University Museum. And then here's a detail of what a cradle board looks like. So it's one and a half inches away from the ball, away from the wall. <laughs> this piece is called Square Knot. And on this piece, it's, I, I did hand stitching again, and I used an image of the reverse side of the stitching. So the knots here make a secondary pattern, a diamond. And I, I like that. I like to see um, what different secondary patterns can be made. And this is in a private collection. This is sold. This is loose ends. It's six by 24 inches. The piece in the center of it is a, a piece of mulberry that has pigmented waxes monoprinted on it. And this is in the collection of my photographer, Dina Rossi. Okay, the next chapter is a series of quilts called Fire in My Soul. And I went back to airbrushing. So sometimes I go back to different techniques and either expand on them or doing do them a little bit differently. So th in this case, I hand painted the backgrounds, this red and yellow passionate colors and airbrushed over top and again, pieced it together like a puzzle. So this is fire in my soul worth. This is 38 by 38. This is fire in my soul dance. This is 49 by 37, and it's a female figure, but it's abstracted enough that you can still see that it's a figure and it has motion and movement. This is 49 by 37. 
This is fire in my soul number three, and this is 29 by 35. I do a lot of different um, surface design techniques. And one of the techniques that I, I work with is batik using soy wax instead of beeswax. Um, and I teach at Praxis Fiber Studio or Fiber Workshop, which is in Cleveland, Ohio, and it's in the Waterloo district. And this was a um, ex exhibition where three of us collaborated on the fabrics in the front window. So my friend Joyce Gentoff and Deb Birkenbile and I did an exhibit there. And Praxis is a... Cleveland area gallery, surface design and weaving area. It's a nonprofit. And so they have weaving looms and uh, areas to teach. So they have, at their, their uh, mission is to promote and revitalize fiber art. And I've been teaching there since uh, they originated six years ago. And they're, they're now doing indigo vats and planting their own dyes and growing uh, their own dye gardens. This is called Floral Fireworks. And it's a quilt that I made using batik as a process. So you do an underpainting and then you wax out certain areas. And I'm using a tool called uh, CHOP, T-J-A-P. And they use it in ballet uh, for batik processes. And then, so here is a detail of the flower floral pattern and on the right is a copper chop that you would use to put hot wax in and so you wax off certain areas and then you over dye or over paint it and then when you remove the wax you have the colors underneath show through I don't often do statement art, but with the changes in women's issues and the political environment, I did feel compelled to express my concerns. So this piece is called Power Grab. I made this in 2017. It's 34 by 35. The left side panel is monoprinted. The, the right side has um, a strip of shibori fabric here. The figure is um, you, used, done using a wax batik, and then it's machine embroidery. And this piece uh, hung at Lakeland Community College in an exhibit called From Women, which is an annual exhibit there. And I have been in that exhibit many times. And this piece also was shown at Women Made Gallery in Chicago in November of 2018. And here is a detail of that piece. And I'm gonna show you a detail of this one first. This is called Safety in Numbers, but I wanted uh, to show you, I, I use safety pins to represent Roman numerals. So I screened the safety pins and uh, the safety pin became a symbol of solidarity and safety. And so I did this quilt and the top, so the Roman numerals start at the top, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10. And so I hand dyed the backgrounds in a gradation and then screen printed the alternate blocks. This is a pretty large piece, it's 30 by 70. And then this is safety in numbers, my, the second one in the series, and this is by fives. So the safety pins were Roman numerals were five, 10, 15, and 20. Uh, I like to do experimental screen printing techniques. I've studied with Kirk Grabowski, Oh, three times now, at least. I love her. She developed the, the deconstructed screen printing process, but also there's uh, different methods of using torn paper and that to um, screen print with as well. 
So this one is called Ripple Effect. It's using the deconstructed screen printing process. And when you change, everything around you changes. So it's like the pebble in the pond. This, in this case, um, the soy wax was on the screen and then I screen printed it with thickened dyes. So when I printed this, there was some green paint on the fabric that actually, that accidentally got on the fabric. So my, when I teach, my philosophy is always to embrace the happy accident. So I did that myself. And so in the green areas, I accented them with some hand embroidery and the piece is called a touch of MB. This piece is called Forging New Directions. This was in Quilt Equals Art Equals Quilt in Auburn, New York in 2018. There's a detail of that piece. This is called Mystery. This piece uses torn newspaper under the screen prints. And it looks like figures and alleyways, so I called it mystery. And this is in a corporate co collection of Erie Insurance. This piece is called Compassion, and it was uh, screen printed. And then on the, the right side, it had some gray fabric, and it just looked like it needed some more. So I made a Thermofax screen of my hand stitching and added that to add more texture to the piece. And there's a detail. This is called Prayers for Peace. It's 40 by 40. This is in a private collection. To get the depth of color on the red in the left side of the piece, I, it was over dyed several times to, to get the color that I wanted. And I started using a little bit of commercial fabric in this black and white strip, but I think it draws your eye in. And then on the right side is uh, a batik process. And I used the a Dove of Peace chop that was gifted to me by a friend. So here's a detail where you can see the close up of the imagery. And then this is the copper chop that was used to create the dove pattern. I wanted to show a little bit of process so that you could see how things were made. This is called the dancer. This was 2018 and the center panel is monoprinted. And again, I like how that little black and white strip draws your eye to the focal point. Here's a detail. I just like the movement in here and it just reminded me of a dancer. This is called Sultry Summer Nights. I made this in 2018 and it's a deconstructed screen printing process. And I, what I like about this piece is it's kind of moody and uh, I guess that's what I need to say. I, I, like, I like the color and the mood of this piece. It's kind of evocative. This piece is titled, If I Had Wings. Uh, it's 45 by 35. Um, I recently sold this piece. It's in a private collection. There's screen printing underneath and then dye painting over top. And uh, I just, I like the movement. I do like action painters a lot. So I do like the, the movement and uh, it looks like birds to me. So it's called If I Had Wings. This piece is called Inferno and this uses a deconstructed screen printing process. It's 20, 38 by 45. And this was in the best of Ohio in 2020, which they didn't hold until 2021. <laughs> so. I did um, a, a, a second solo exhibit at the Ashtabula Arts Center in June of 2017. And I want, would like to read you my statement from that exhibit. 
I am inspired by the interconnections that occur in both personal relationships and artwork. I've integrated marks and patterns made by both myself and others so that it creates a piece much broader in meaning. My art in this exhibition explores variation on a pattern or theme. For example, shared humanity, safety in numbers and talking circles. A single pattern can be, got, can be combined in many ways to create effects from subtle to dramatic. My hope is that you will be inspired to step outside your own circle and connect with others who may be different or struggling. It is the connections and relationships that we build in this world that bring personal meaning to our lives. So this is, uh, when you walk in, this is the, when you walk into the Asheville Art Center, this is the wall that's straight back. And I really think it's important to see how works interact and play together and how they look hung. So this was uh, part of my installation. This is the back wall. It's a, a, it's a long side wall. So this is like half of the wall. And my photographer, Dina Rossi came and took these installation shots for me. Okay, you can see the safety and numbers, the large piece on the left. And then there's a ramp going up on the right side. This was my first installation piece and it's interactive and it's called Talking Circles Intercommunication. And I had read, I had read a book uh, and ha had heard Gloria Steinem talk. And she talked about talking circles and listening and she would go to college campuses and talk. And so I was really inspired by that. And so this was a, a very much collaborative collaborative, but it also grew organically throughout the exhibit. So I hand dyed the fabrics and my friend Elia came over and helped me assemble the blocks. So we assembled the fabrics. And so there, there's um, quilt batting in between. So they're layered and cut. My friend Joyce Gentoff surged all the edges, edges and my friend Deb Berkebile helped me screen print the circles. So in the basket in the left, all the blocks were left there. And I asked people to write either a quote or a positive message. And so, and then there was safety pins there. And so they could attach the block. So this grew organically during the month that this was at the Ashabilla Arts Center. This I think has to be one of my favorite walls because I just like the flow of the color from one piece into the next and into the next. And it's bright and this is kind of a sitting area at the Ashtabula Art Center. And then this is the entry where you come into the Art Center. So you can't stand back very far away from these pieces. Um, and then my statement was there when you came in. This piece is um, called Nine Patch Cross. And it's a, it was part of an exhibit where we used inspirations from deaccession textiles from the Cleveland Museum of Art. So I had a Guatemalan textile, which I'll show here. That was that was the textile that I used for my inspiration. And then this was my interpretation of that textile. It's 26 by 38. While I was making this piece, there was the shooting in Charleston, South Carolina at the Emanuel African Methodist Episcopal Church. And so the crosses were assembled with nine pieces. And so I let the cross hang down in the center and it's called Nine Patch Cross in Memory of the Lives Lost. Here is a detail of that piece. And I like quilting with variegated threads. I also change thread colors in different areas. 
I really want um, the quilting to enhance the piece and to add structure. There's the Guatemalan textile again. This piece is called Not Quite Full Circle. It's hand painted and a petite process in the bottom two thirds and machine quilted with variegated, machine variegated threads. And then more recently, I have been exploring shibori and indigo and discharge techniques. So I would say 2017, 2018. So this is a combination of artwork by Deb Berkebile, Joyce Juntoff, and myself. And this exhibit was at Praxis Fiber Workshop in Cleveland. This piece is titled Interwoven. And it's a, I started with black fabric. And on the left hand side, I discharged the fabric and then over dyed it in indigo. And again, a little bit of that black and white stripe to make things pop. And the title interwoven came from the patterning on the right side, which kind of looks like a basket weave to me. And the variegated threads disappear and reappear on that side of the piece. And then this is my quilt national piece called Shifting Sand Sapphire Skies. It was made in 2020 and it's 37 by 39 inches. And I am exploring more indigo dyeing and shibori techniques. So I use discharge. Uh, Arashi shibori is pole, wrap, pole wrapping and uh, resist. So that's one of the processes used. Itajimi is clamping with shapes to create the patterns. And so there's discharge, there's Arashi and Itajimi shibori in this piece. And um, this is the first of a series of three so far, a uh, fourth one in process. And to me, this series represents shifting energy and connections to past traditions. And I'm really in love with the bold patterns and the color combination. And when I was at Quilt National for the opening, a lady said to me that she thought my title was very poetic. <laughs> This is a detail. This is the second one in the series, and this is Shifting Sands, Sapphire Skies with Nautilus. This is fairly large, 41 by 57. And then this is Shifting Sands, Sapphire Skies with Midnight Moon. So I like a good alliteration. <laughs> this is 48 by 42. And here is a detail of the midnight moon. And then another process that you can use is stitch shibori. So you hand stitch on a piece of fabric and you pull it, you pull the stitching up so that it's gathered really tight. And then when you dye it and then pull out the stitching, you get uh, the patterning. So this is my neighbor. I live out in the middle of nowhere and I have a neighbor that's also a quilter <laughs> and her name is Deb Berkebile. And her, she and I, <laughs> Deb and I have, hosted master classes with international instructors at my studio. Uh, when I was, I, I did some indigo processes with Deb and she bought the book of Stitch Shibori with Jane Callender. And um, she said, Deb said to me uh, that she looked up Jane and Jane was gonna be teaching in the United States and Jane's from the UK. And she said, if I get Jane to come here, can we, can we use your studio? If I could get her to teach, I said, yeah, because I thought, oh, this will never happen. But it actually did happen. So this is uh, 
Jane Callender's artwork on my design wall, which is incredible, incredibly, incredible stitching. And we did a five day masterclass using my studio with 12 people. And this was in April of 2018. So there's uh, Jane, she liked to be called Callie. So she's in the center. I'm on the left, Deb's on the right. This is after five days and some of the pieces were torn off the wall there. So. <laughs> the indigo, I have an indigo vat in my dye lab, which is also known as my garage. Um, so you, the, the, the garbage pail, it's not a garbage, well, it is a garbage pail, but it, the indigo vat is in there and that's what we're dyeing the fabrics in. So you can see us holding the strings and dunking our fabric in the indigo. On the right side is uh, an indigo class that I held and you can see my cornfield in the back. <laughs> And this is Kasali Adeyemo, and Deb and I hosted him in 2020. He, we met him in New York, and when Deb's daughter got married in New Mexico, we got to go to his studio in Santa Fe. And Kasali is from Nigeria originally, and he teaches indigo processes from his culture. So he, treat, he teaches traditional Yoruba Adiri, Aleko, and tie-dye is what he taught. <laughs> and uh, he's a wonderful teacher. And we used cassava paste as the resist. So these are samples of fabrics that Kasali made. And because it was 2020 and the pandemic was going on, we had to pivot. And instead of using my studio, we rented tents and we held the class outside. Other dyeing methods that I've used is ice dyeing. So you soda ash soak your fabric first and arrange it and put your dyes or dye powders either under or over ice. And so as the ice crystals melt, the dye goes through the fabric. And so the, this piece on the right is some of the patterning that is created from ice dyeing. This is my studio mascot. This is Tucker and he has his ice dyed scarf on. Uh, for several years in a row, I held an open studio and I had the Humane Society come. And so we have a meet and greet of the animals in the living room and we'd have artists there. And so my whole house turned into like this open studio. So um, Tucker came uh, as part of the meet and greet and he stayed <laughs> and now part of our family. This is my new studio supervisor, Jenny. She's in charge of quality control now. And this is my studio. Uh, before I clean up, I like to work in a bit of creative clutter. I usually generally know what pile things are in. This is my studio after cleaning up. <laughs> Looks eerily similar than before. <laughs> And then here I am back to the blank canvas. So I hope that you've had some new, received some new ideas or some inspiration. And I hope I inspire you to learn something new. It's been a pleasure to share my journey with you. And the final uh, slide is uh, photography credits is uh, Dina A. Rossi, Deb Berkebile, myself and others took photographs for this. My website is sandyschellenbergerstudio.com, and I'm also on Facebook and Instagram. So thank you. Wonderful. So we have uh, quite a few comments <laughs> and questions. Awesome.
So we'll let that stay up there a couple more moments. And then if you want to stop share, then we'll just chat through those questions whenever you feel good about that. Okay. And then, wow, we got lots of people. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Wonderful. That was so great. So uh, we had a couple of questions that, that happened during your chat. Okay. Uh, and comments, of course. So one is from uh, Georgianne saying, beautiful work. Sandy, love your soy wax workshop at Praxis. So clearly someone that attended and is. Hey. is <laughs> um, and then uh, Carol was curious if you could uh, rename the uh, Shibori practices that the techniques once again just to call them out so that folks can perhaps write them down if they're curious and want to try their hand at it yes this was when you were speaking specifically about the work that you have in the current show uh-huh uh, arash arashi shibori is pole wrapping um it, it can be wrapped around a pvc pole or sometimes clothesline and itajimi is the other process and that's clamping process using shapes uh, to create the resist. And there's a lot of resources out there for folks that are interested in Shibori that probably uh, chat further about those specific things. But again, I mean, you're, you're doing master classes. So, you know, if, if folks are really interested, go ahead and, and get on that mailing list so that you can be included. Yeah. Uh, I had a friend of mine say to me um, when I when I teach at Praxis, she goes, you never see, teach the same class the same way twice. <laughs> so the, when I learn new things, I pass that along and share it as well. I love that. Uh, so from Carrie, she says, Sandy, as always, I love seeing your work and hearing your process with your encaustic work. Do you ever add actual stitches to the wood board panels? I have not. <laughs> I've thought about it. But, uh, I've had people look at the, at the squares sideways to see if the actual stitching is there or not. <laughs> Wonderful. And we have a comment from Leanne saying your basket weave quilting with the variegated thread is really interesting and that the Quilt National 21 piece is rich with color and texture. So, you know, everything folks would want to hear, right? Yes, thank you. Uh, lots of comments and, and uh, kind of you rock and love your staff and all of that <laughs> for you um, and your neighbor's partnership <laughs> and saying that this was inspiring. So uh, we have a question again from Carol, the indigo and brown pieces, what were the names of those techniques? The indigo. Oh, discharge. Yeah, uh, so discharge is a color removal process and I use thiox and it's heated in a pan and you need to have good ventilation for that. And so you start with a darker fabric and then you can remove color and then you can leave it like it is or you can over dye it then at that point. Perfect. So um, something that we chatted about um, gosh, like a month ago at this point, maybe <laughs> I think, was uh, in looking through your presentation, it was really apparent to me how treasured learning is for you. It becomes apparent in your work. Can you talk a little bit about um, how you have nurtured that curiosity and how you approach incorporation uh, for folks that may be a little nervous to try something new. I'm, I would love to hear you talk just a little bit more about the journey of learning and how that comes into your work. Um, I think it's really important to always stay curious and to say, what if? And um, no, everybody starts, has a different starting place, especially when you're taking a class. And so we all learn from each other as well. And so I don't think anybody should be intimidated when you take a class. I think it's it's playing, it's exploring, it's uh, asking what if. And I've always I've I've taken I've taken a lot of classes. Um, more recently, they've been in the encaustic process. Um, so I, I just always felt it was important to learn. Wonderful. Uh, we have a, an operational question from okay. Elliot 
curious if you are uh, hosting any international artists this summer. You know, we've done it every two years and um, we don't have one on the agenda right now. <laughs> Although think, well, we would like to have um, Gasali back and, and I don't think Jane Callender is going to travel back to the States uh, in the near future. So. Wonderful. So uh, I'd love to hear from you. Um, who is inspiring you right now? And it, you know, it could be other fiber artists. It could be um, something not to do with art. But what what is uh, kind of pulling your consciousness and your attention for your work right now? Uh, um, I, I'm still kind of enamored with this shibori process. And um, you can see some of the fabrics behind me that I've created. And I'm really good at creating fabrics, but uh, you know, you have to use them. So, you know, how am I gonna use them? What am, what am I going to put them with? How to make uh, the design patterns? So I'm, I am still enamored of the indigo process, the Ishibori processes, but how to combine them now so that they make uh, a quilt. Wonderful. And so piggybacking onto that, uh, talk a little bit about what a day in the studio is like for you. Like what does, what does your practice look like? <laughs> Very erratic. <laughs> erratic and sporadic and I'm very inspired by deadlines so when it's up close to a deadline I might be working 10 hours uh I like to work at night you know when I was nursing I worked night shifts so um I'm kind of the night owl person um and I always overestimate how much I can get done in a certain amount of time so <laughs> um but on a daily I like to uh, schedule studio time um ideally for four to five hours, uh, at least three times a week. So when you when you enter your studio, if you've scheduled that time, uh, but take us through that process. How do you, I know that you said erratic, but there's, there's always a little bit of ritual. And the reason I ask is just, you know, plenty of folks have differing approaches. And I think it's really interesting, particularly when you're talking about, uh, a type of work that requires so much time, right? Like not only do you have the time of, of piecing and then quilting, but it's all of the before as well, like creating the fabric, dyeing the fabric. So um, with respect to that time and how you organize that, uh, take us through a session of, of your day. Okay. So um I'm, I'm not much of a morning person. So morning is like taking care of the dogs and taking them out and um, meandering to the studio around 10 or 11. I, for, a, uh, for a couple of months, I was getting into a ritual of lighting a candle and doing some morning pages, doing some writing. Um, and I would like to get back to that. Uh, when I have a break, it, break in that it's kind of hard to get back to that and um oh yeah and exercise is important to me too because I do kickboxing <laughs> so I work with a trainer so a couple mornings a week is working with the trainer and um uh morning pages are important to me because I I think it uh, helps um I, they call it brain drain. I don't like that term, but anyway, you just getting things on paper. I feel like writing down goals and that is very important as well, um, because when you write it down, it's more likely to become reality. And um, I'm kind of slow starting. So I, I would maybe pin fabrics to the wall to start with. And then I would look through the fabrics that I have made and see what might go with it. Sometimes I just drop them on the floor and, and look and maybe get inspired by two pieces of fabric being next to each other. And then I will start arranging. Uh, and then after I have a piece um, put together, I, I like to look at it. I spend a, a lot of time looking at it and deciding is it finished or isn't it finished? Does it need anything more? 
And then when I, when I feel a piece is good, it's very intimidating to then take that piece and put it on the quilting machine because it's either going to enhance it or I have actually ruined a couple pieces at that point. So, so it's a little bit intimidating at that point. I put that off a lot. <laughs> so. I think what I'm hearing you, you say, and I, I, I love this, um, looking at your work and, and how things line up, there is this uh, near, near to, you know, like adjacent to magic, right? Like how things talk to each other. And yes. What I think I'm hearing is you create opportunities for chance. So yes. by placing things on the, or like, you know, scattering things on the floor, you create an opportunity for you to see something that you couldn't if you're too rigid within a space. Is that right? Absolutely. Yes. I'm, I'm not one that draws out or plans out my quilts ahead of time. They kind of... Um, it's kind of an organic in nature or by chance, like you said, yes. Yes, Wonderful. very much so. Perfect. Um, so within that process, I, you know, understanding kind of the ethereal nature of chance and how that comes together for your work. I'm curious in the dyeing process, do you take that all the way back to plant? Like, do you harvest your own indigo to create the dye? I do not. I'm a more synthetic gal. <laughs> so I use Procyon MX dyes, which are professional quality dyes. But I do have in, in my dye lab, which is also the garage, is I, I have an organic vat of indigo, a synthetic, and then a tint. So we have like a light, medium, and dark tints, but there it's uh, one's organic and one's synthetic. Okay, hey, so before we close out, I want to uh, offer you the opportunity if there's anything that you want to make sure that you um, mention during this talk, uh, I, I'll give you that opportunity, but this has been really lovely, so just giving you a moment. Okay, well, I just hope that um, people are willing to explore their own creativity and find inspiration uh, whether it's at a, an exhibit or whether it's out in nature, uh, and to ask themselves, what if? Perfect. Um, so thank you again, Sandy. This has been really, really delightful. Uh, and thank you all for joining us for this Artist Talk by Sandy Schellenberger as a part of our programming for the Quilt National 2021, the Best of Contemporary Quilts exhibition. Yeah. I'd like to give a special thank you to the Dairy Barn for putting on such a great biennial exhibition to the participating artists and to the Ohio Arts Council's board, the Ohio legislature, and the governor who support the OAC, this great space, and of course, Ohio artists. Thanks everyone, take care.